I live in Nashville, and I'm a retired psychiatrist. Uh, the last year that I practiced, I actually uh, worked in New Zealand. I decided to do a locum tenens and went to New Zealand because I wanted to see what it was like to practice in a country that actually has a national health program. And guess what? It isn't perfect, but it sure is a lot better than what we do. So um, what I'm, I'd like to just do a few thank yous first. Uh, number one to Dixon from our PNHP staff. Uh, he's on the call, and he walked me through all the technical stuff this morning. And I can tell you I was way more nervous about that than I was about doing the actual presentation. Um, so thank you, Dixon. Uh, Matt uh, Petty is also on the call, and he'll be, I guess, dealing with the, I don't know, are, are we going to mute and unmute phones, Matt? Um, only I'm guessing so. Okay, only if there's distractions, great. And, um, and then thank you to uh, Emily Henkels for even suggesting that we do this webinar. Uh, it's really exciting that we have been getting requests at the national office for speakers for things other than grand rounds, uh, you know, PowerPoint single payer presentations and enough of them that Emily suggested that it might be a good idea to have a webinar that is specifically um, focused on how to give a, how to, how to speak up for single payer um, in settings other than, um, other than a grand round presentation. So, we're going to talk about doing a speaking up for single payer at a rally, at a town hall, and at a public forum. And I guess the most important thing I want to say is it really is different. This is not the same thing as doing a grand rounds PowerPoint presentation. What are what are the? I mean, and, and I know that many people on this call have have done one of these or maybe all of these spoken at a rally at a town hall or at a public forum in addition to doing grand rounds. So what I'm saying is certainly not meant to be, um, you know, uh, dogma or, or best practices. It's really what I have found through trial and error are some points that are worth taking note of. And what I'm going to do is, is I'll talk for about 30 minutes, and then in the time we have remaining, and we are going to keep it to an hour because for those who are um, wanting to get their supper or go to bed, I want to respect that. Uh, but rather than have it be sort of traditional q and A, I'm, I'm really thinking that the, the last 30 minutes is going to be more of, of um, all of us sharing our own experience and um, pointers. And I'm going to take some notes on what you guys tell me that I didn't think of, uh, because then I will put together a, um, a little document that maybe we can distribute uh, that everybody will have. And it'll be the things I thought of and the things you thought of to make our presentations the most effective. So that's, that's the plan. Um, so let's start with giving a, speaking up for, for single payer at a rally. And when I think of a rally, I'm thinking the ones that I have been to this year have been very time limited. They want several speakers and they want them to um, speak for sometimes as little as 90 seconds. And so in that kind of a setting, you have to make sure that every word counts. Don't make it 
too long, TLDL, too long, didn't listen. Uh, there's, that's a, a takeoff on um, TLDR, too long, didn't read, which is what they tell us about um, doing emails. You, you want your email to be short enough that people are actually going to read it all the way to the end. So when you're speaking at a rally, don't make, it, don't make your talking too long because people won't listen. Do your homework. Know who your audience is. Um, if you're speaking to a group of, you know, a community group who are composed of um, a lot of people from the Indivisible movement, uh, I had one of, I, I did one of those earlier this spring, I have to be aware that they may not, they may be more interested in not um, going backwards from the ACA and not as familiar with single payer. And so I'm going to be wanting to frame my messaging in such a way that I'm acknowledging that we don't want to go backwards from the ACA, uh, but that going forward, the, the real solution is single payer. So I had a, um, I'll talk about another rally that I did recently that involved um, speaking at a Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way um, union, railroad union uh, rally. Well, what do I know about labor's, labor unions? Just about nothing. And what do I know about um, contract negotiations? Not very much. And what do I know about railroads? I like to ride on them. That's about it. So for me, the homework for that rally actually involved um, going to two separate meetings where I, I met with the organizer for the one, one of the organizers for the uh, Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way employees and took copious notes just so that I understood where that what that union is and what their issues are, which right now have to do with um, they're in a labor, a very protracted labor um, negotiation, contract negotiation with the class one railroad carriers. So even though uh, ultimately I spoke for 90 seconds, I went to two meetings ahead of time just so that I'd know what, the, what their issues are that I can frame my messaging to. And then the second was just to understand kind of where they wanted me to speak in the lineup and the kinds of chants that they were going to be doing and, and letting me know that it was going to be a megaphone instead of a um, microphone and that it was going to take place at 5.30 in the morning. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, before these um, these men went started their morning um, shift, so it is sometimes um, you're going to spend ten times more time getting ready for the rally than actually speaking. Another. Uh, pointer that I think is important is as much as possible try not to read a, a prepared statement. Um, it's tempting and I fall into that trap myself. I just feel nervous and I'd rather have a piece of paper that I can glance at. If you're, if you're going to do that, at least don't write it out word for word. Just Put a couple of talking points in case you get nervous and lose your, your place. 
But really, when, when you're only going to get to speak for a, a few, you know, a, a minute or two, um, you really want to connect with your audience and do that in a, uh, a more extemporaneous way. Now, that isn't to say that you might, in some circumstances, want to have a prepared statement that you can um, read or deliver to reporters if you know that, they're, that the press is going to be there. Um, that may be a, a very useful thing to do. And I always think if it's, if it's possible, um, have someone – capturing it on Facebook Live or, or on video so that you can post it to your Facebook page. You can always send it um, to PNHP, and we can post it um, to our Facebook page. Um, just be thinking about how to get the most bang for the buck um, no matter what you're doing, whether you're speaking at a, you know, a rally, a town hall, a forum, whatever. So I thought I would just quickly give an example of um, the rally that, and I think, I don't know if Ann Sheets is on this call. I know she did one of these rallies out in Chicago with the Maintenance of Way uh, employees um, probably the week before I did. But this one that I did was on May 3rd, and um, – John Lozier, who is with, uh, he's on the board of um, Healthcare Now and is also a, um, and a member of PNHP and a fellow Nashvillian. So John um, spoke um, right after the sort of big wigs on the railroad and, and then he introduced me. So and I was told in this particular instance, I really had, they wanted me to, to go no more than, than 90 seconds. And they really liked chants. This, they, he told me that they really like um, to do chants. So what I, what I said was, um, and, I, and I wore my white coat. That, I didn't put that on the slide, but if, if you have a white coat or scrubs, I really think that can be an effective um, visual if you're speaking to a group that's not primarily other physicians. What I said was, um, greetings, I am one of 21,000 doctors, nurses, health professionals, and medical students who agree that you deserve good health care. I spoke that slowly and intentionally because the tendency is to want to say a whole lot and speak really fast. And what you really want to do is speak very slowly, choose your words carefully, and allow them time to react. Um, and then I just said, you know, union workers are leading the way. Your struggle helps all of us who struggle to get good health care. And then we did a chant, forward together, not one step back, which I borrowed from the, uh, I think that's a, a chant that's done frequently on uh, the Moral Monday um, rallies in North Carolina. So we did, we chanted that once or twice, and then I said, not one step back, and not 228 steps back either, in the form of higher monthly premiums. And they all knew what I was talking about, because one of the things I learned is that one of the biggest bones of contention is that the, the carriers, the railroad um, bosses want them to accept a, um, a health care plan that is on par with what non-labor, non-union workers get. 
And apparently in the United States, the average uh, worker pays about 34% of their premium. So the carriers are saying, we want you to accept an increase in your premium of $228 a month and add on uh, co-pays at the point of service that they never had before. So by saying that, I'm, I'm connecting with something that I know is absolutely a trigger point for them, and that gets their attention. And then I finished up with a national single-payer improved Medicare for all is the way forward. Because the, the chant had been forward together, not one step back, not 228 steps back in the form of higher monthly premiums. A national single-payer Medicare for all is the way forward. And I said, I'll, I'm, I'm going to stay after the rally. If anybody wants to learn more about single payer, and thank you for listening. And we ended with everybody in, nobody out. Done. Mm-hmm. So, so I, again, the points are. It, I think the shorter the time you have to speak, sometimes the more time you need to put into making sure you know who your audience is, know what the the hot-button items are for them, and then end with the solution to pretty much any problem, healthcare finance problem you can come up with is going to be single-payer Medicare for all. Um, And if they know what HR 676 is, I mean, you you know, you decide what what you think is best. So I'm going to move on to the next um, situation, which is um, speaking up for single payer at a town hall meeting. And goodness knows we've had plenty of those, hallelujah. Um, So again, I think this is a situation where wearing your white coat or your scrubs is a good idea for one thing if it's a situation where you're not sure you're going to get called on that's a way to kind of stand out and increase the likelihood of you getting called on Uh, if you again know that the people who are attending the town hall include a lot of kindred spirits and you have time to prepare uh, make some Medicare for all signs or get some of the, the, uh, the signs that we have at the PNHP office, which are small but very readable and, um, and effective. I, I did a town hall with Jim Cooper in late March, the first one, and <clears throat> found a bunch of people ahead of time who were willing to hold on to Medicare for all improved Medicare for all signs. And I told them, when I, if I get called on and I stand up and I say, Congressman Cooper, will you co-sponsor HR 676 or, or say Medicare for all, hold up your sign and start cheering. I mean, tell them what you want them to do. Um, a lot of this, I think town hall is political theater. And you want to make the, again, you want to make the best of it. So speak directly to your member of Congress or your legislator. Look directly at them. Tell them who you are. Maybe tell a short either personal or patient health story, not a long one. Just give them enough information to make your point. And I'll give you an example, one that is, and this is, I mean, don't make something up, obviously. God knows we all have plenty of personal or family or patient stories. Um, <laughs> and one that I often, one that I often use is um, a patient whose brother is an uninsured <laughs> roofer. And he fell off the roof. 
of a house that he was doing. And she told me that as he was falling, he prayed that he would die because he knew that if he survived, um, he would go bankrupt. He would bankrupt his family with medical expenses. And he did survive, and she was telling me about all of his financial woes as a result of his injuries. So tell us, if, you know, tell a little story, make your point very quickly. Congressman, I don't want to work in a, a, a health care system where my patients are not only sick, but they're also worried and stressed out about how they're going to pay for the care that they need. And then make your ask very, very clearly. Um, Congressman Cooper, will you co-sponsor H.R. 676? And don't sit down when you make your ask. Hang on to the microphone and stay standing. The member of Congress will answer in whatever way they do. Um, the first town hall with Jim Cooper, he, he answered in a very circuitous way about um, the Medicare trust fund going broke and the need to fix that before we start talking about expanding Medicare. And I was not satisfied with that answer. And I said, um, all right, if, if, if we put the financing aside, would you tell me whether at least you agree in, in principle that health care for everyone is a, is a goal, is a reasonable goal? And I couldn't even get a, quite a straight answer from that, and I, I figured I could persist with one more statement, and I said, I, I want you to know that I'm meeting with you at your office next week, and I'm going to bring um, specific information about how this plan is financed. And I also want you to know that I'm going to continue organizing in your district um, and growing the movement for um, Medicare for All. And again, I said Medicare for All, everybody cheered and clapped, and at that point I sat down. So I made sure that I got someone who knows how to do Facebook Live to sit next to me, so he got everything on Facebook Live. And the other thing that I did was when the town hall was over, I saw that the press was there and they were interviewing um, my congressman, Jim Cooper. And when they finished interviewing him and he walked away, um, I'm pretty bold. I just went up and said, uh, I'm Dr. Carol Paris, and I'm the president of Physicians for a National Health Program, and if you'd like to interview me, I'd be very happy to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. Well, they ended up interviewing me on, I forget which local TV station, and when it aired that evening, what actually was aired was a, um, a visual of Jim Cooper speaking, but the reporter was talking, and sort of explaining what the town hall was all about. And then it cut to me, and it was me talking about why we need a national health program. So I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity if I hadn't just hung around after the town hall and sort of pushed my way into that opportunity. So don't be afraid to Put yourself out there and say, I'd be happy to be interviewed. Here's my card or here's my information. So we've got about five more minutes before we open this up. I'm maybe talking too much. Let's see. The last one is um, speaking at a 
Speak, speaking up for single payer at a public forum. And I think of a public forum as being a sort of, I went from the shortest amount of time to speak to the longest. So the shortest amount of time is probably going to be at a rally, then at a town hall, and finally at a public forum. If you're invited to speak at a public forum, you're still not likely to be invited to do a PowerPoint presentation, and I would discourage you from doing that even if you can. Again, these are not going to be people who are medical professionals. They're everyday um, folks who are much more influenced by your authenticity and your story and a little bit of supporting data. And then get on with it. Make your point, draw a conclusion, and in this case, be sure to end with a, a call to action. So my name is Dr. Carol Paris. I'm president of Physicians for a National Health Program. Um, I'd like to tell you a story about a patient. I might tell them my patient who fell off the roof, um, and he didn't die, and his family suffered tremendous financial hardship during his, his recuperation. And then I talk about the bankruptcy um, data, which is pretty easy to remember, um, you know, the ma majority of personal bankruptcies in this country are because of medical debt, and more than 75% of those people had health insurance when they got sick. So it didn't prevent them from financial hardship to the point of even bankruptcy. Um, so a little bit of supporting data. Don't get too carried away. Again, I think the tendency is to want to um, win the day with heaps and heaps of data, but people can't, they're not going to be impressed by um, getting overwhelmed with data. Choose the, the talking points carefully and use the data that's going to support your story. Uh, again, make a concise point. I don't, I don't want to work in a healthcare system that treats its, its um, that, that, that requires me to um, treat people in, a, in, in such a way that they're, they're more stressed out trying to figure out how they're going to afford treatment. Um, I, I went into medicine to, to take care of people, not to, not to cause them more stress. Um, make a strong concluding statement. I think the solution is single payer, Medicare for all. Uh, you might want to talk about a poll, you know, polls show the popularity of single payer is growing and the majority of Americans are now supporting it, upwards of 60%. You know, pick whatever poll you want to use. I'm not going to, I don't, you know, there's so many of them. Pick the one that you can remember. And, and I think the most important thing is to end with a call to action because these are people who are potentially able to go home and talk to their neighbor, talk to their spouse, write a letter to the editor, and call their member of Congress and tell them, I want you to co-sponsor H.R. 676. If it's Senate, I want you to... Um, look into Bernie Sanders' plan, which we're hoping he's going to be introducing soon, um, but give them a call to action. And this is also a place where, you know, you might mention if you want to learn more, you can go to, you know, www.pnhp.org. Um, I don't have a specific example for you, but I'm sure plenty of people on the call have examples, so I'd like to open it up now. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad to take questions, but when I looked at the 
comments that some of the people who were signing up for the call, uh, some of your comments, uh, it seemed like a lot of them had to do with answering difficult questions. And that's not really what the purpose of this webinar is. I will, if you have some that you want to ask, I'll do the best I can. But I think in general, if you get asked a difficult question in one of these settings, um, if you know the answer, you know the answer. If you don't know the answer, don't budget. Just say, you know, I, I don't know, but give me your name and number, and I'll get the information for you, and I'll get back to you. I, I think there's nothing wrong with, with just saying, I don't know, and I can find out. So let's open it up and hear from all the other experts out there who have been doing rallies and town halls and forums. And, what, and maybe what we'll do is just say your name, and I'll, we'll just kind of create a stack. When we get four or five names, we'll take them in order. So is anybody? Art, Art Sutherland, Memphis. Okay. Anyone else? Near um, uh, West Virginia. I, I missed the name. Debbie McNear in West Virginia. Debbie McNear, okay. Marsha Fretwell in North Madden. Carolina. Marsha in North Carolina. Great, we're getting different mm -hmm. parts of the South. Kendall Clark, New Hampshire. Is it Kim, did you say? That's right, New Hampshire. Okay, New Hampshire, okay. Rick Madden in New Mexico. All right, why don't we start Green, with Bill? Colorado. Okay. Lee All right, why don't we start with those? Lee? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there for now. Art, well, why don't you start? Well, I, I appreciate what you're doing, Carol. I, I think this is really good. And, um, yeah. I think we all get too technical about what we're doing, and we, we feel like we're the experts. Uh, but what you said is very human and, and should relate to other humans. So I, I, I applaud what you're doing. Okay. Thank you. Debbie from West Virginia. Um, thank you. I attended a, a, a community forum training last week. We were able to do some exercises that were one-on-one, -on -one, and the two women that I worked with one-on-one -on -one were both younger and had no idea what I was talking about when I said the words single payer or Medicare for all. But they yeah. immediately knew what universal health care was. And so my husband and I have been involved in PHP for many, 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 many years and have always used um, single payer or Medicare for all more recently. And I wonder what the thinking is about I, I, I get the idea that universal health care has some negative connotations for um, certain parts of the political spectrum, maybe. Um, <laughs> but it, <laughs> But then explaining what single care is when universal health care is so easily understood, I just wonder what your thinking is on that in a community forum that's, kind of setting. Okay. That's, that's a great question. And yes. um, I think that many people hear universal health care um, or national health program and think NHS. Uh, they think the British system where um, it's publicly funded and publicly delivered health care, which many people associate with socialism. So 
we have tended to stay away from that. Single payer resonates with some people. Medicare for all resonates with some people. But I think it's great that you were in a situation with young people where that neither of those terms maybe made much sense to them, or they hear Medicare and think that that's just for old people. And one of the, what I like to do is just ask people, what's the point of insurance, any kind of insurance? What are you doing? Well, you're, you're managing risk. And what's the best way to um, spread risk? Well, you want to have a whole bunch of people in your insurance plan because the more people you have in there, the more you're able to spread risk. And then I say, you know, we, and I, and I, um, I think it was Deb Richter who, who taught me this little talking point. Um, she, she said, you know, we, we know that at any point in time, only 20% of people are actually sick or, or injured and using the healthcare system. So as long as the risk pool includes everybody, then we're distributing the risk sufficiently that it becomes it becomes a, a feasible way to manage risk. But what are we doing? Okay, let's hear from the next person so we can cover everybody. All right. I think that's okay. Good, but... So that. But all right. So I, I think that you just try to break it down for them with an example. Okay. Thank you. Marsha in the new okay. Thank you, Debbie. Marsha. In North Carolina. I'm a physician who just finished 40 years of caring for uh, frail older people. Everybody in my practice was on Medicare. My revenue line was 97% Medicare. So I've actually had experience practicing medicine under a single payer. How can I use that? Is that a legitimate thing? Because what I, I ended up retiring and being the happiest doctor in town because mm. I did not have to worry. I, I was still in love with medicine when I retired. And, mm. I, you know, you, oh, just have, Marcia, you just have to talk. Use that. Okay. Oh, absolutely okay. use that. Okay. I just wanted to know if that was okay. That is, that is That's so wonderful. powerful. Okay. That is so All right. powerful because I'll tell you the the sad truth that I use yeah. over and over again, I must have said this 10 times in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill last week to various legislative assistants, and that is that last year the Surgeon General identified his two biggest public health concerns as, number one, the opioid epidemic, and number two, physician burnout. Right. No. And it, it was extraordinary. So so, okay. I, uh, said, I'll, I'm a happy doctor. Go with it. That is okay. I'm going to go. I'm going to adopt that. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Jim, yes. And I have one more, Jim. one, one other part of it too was I got in trouble okay. in my practice. Medicare wasn't paying me. So I called my senators. They fixed it in two days. Yeah. If I'd called an insurance company, I would have gotten nothing. Anyway. All right. Thank you. Good. That's another, that's another good story you should tell, though. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just, I'm, it's a little bit different than the way we've been going at it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Kim? Uh, thanks, Carol. Terrific presentation, and the comments uh, and questions are great. I'm a geriatrician also. Our, our group in New Hampshire suspects that reaching out to the business community uh, may help move uh, universal health care or Medicare for all forward in New Hampshire. And um, I guess we are planning to speak with some rotary groups and wonder if you had any recommendations 
uh, about um, speaking with um, uh, business meetings? Thank you. That's a great question. And I want to point out to you a, uh, and jot this down, it's um, BLT, yep. let's see, Business Leaders Transforming Healthcare, B-L-T-H, I think it's dot O-R-G. Okay. Business Leaders Transforming Healthcare. And mm -hmm. this is a, a new coalition that was started by Richard Master, who is the director and producer of the movies Fix It, Healthcare at the yes. Tipping Point, and his new movie on um, pharma. Mm -hmm. this, he, he absolutely agrees that we've got to get business on board. And this is a campaign to get not only small businesses, but large, um, larger businesses to uh, sign on and support um, Medicare for All. Mm -hmm. So I would go to that website, read up on it, and when you're speaking at Rotary Groups, tell them about this campaign huh. and encourage them to, um, to check it out and to sign on. Sure. Can I, uh, okay. can I agree and just mention the New York Times Warren Buffett? Yeah, mm -hmm. article. Is that one? that one? Mm -hmm. it's, okay. Thanks. Is everybody aware that? May 8th. Yeah, that May Warren, 8th. Great. Buffett. He's saying that's the big, that's the big problem to worry about. That's before everything else happened a couple of days ago. <laughs> and I think, I think, I think Warren Buffett called had some kind of a quote about a tapeworm that that this is the the um it's it's a tapeworm that's destroying business i i don't know the exact quote yet um yes i think it would be worth <laughs> it would be worth finding yeah, this, that quote and keeping it in your back yeah. pocket you know, let me see if i can access it okay okay let's move on to um Rich in New Mexico. Rich, are you there? Yes, I'm sorry. It took me a bit to unmute. Uh, name's Rick Madden. I'm a family <laughs> physician. Been, oh, Rick. Been in practice 37 years in a small town. And my, uh, my experience that I wanted to share was uh, I was invited by the Valencia County Democratic Women, where I live, to talk about health care. I talked about 30 minutes. And they were interested in everything. They cheered when I mentioned single payer as the option that we need to think about in this time of stress and threat from the feds. And uh, the story that, that really made sense to them was how uh, much um, my patients benefited by the Medicaid expansion. We're 45% we're now uh, Medicaid in New Mexico. And mm. just seeing those patients, just similar to what uh, the, the geriatrician said, the, the, the fact that they could get health care made them so happy, and that made me happy for them. You're so this happy. Is a rural, rural <laughs> setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, just, I, the fact I just that, made my that point. The Medicaid expansion, okay, that the Medicaid expansion, which you can make the point, the best part of the ACA, well, two things. The best part of it was the Medicaid expansion, which is a public program, not a private for-profit one. <laughs> and, and another talking point I've been using recently is the best thing the ACA did is it created an expectation in this country that we can have affordable, quality health care for everyone. That, that is an expectation that was not present in 2009 when Barack Obama was talking about improving health care. And now... You know, even Donald Trump campaigned on 
uni- making it universal, everybody having, well, access to health care. So the, the idea is that we need to say that the expectation is that we can achieve affordable quality health care in this country. The problem is we can't, we can't achieve it with the ACA any more than we can with the AHCA. So the expectation is there, but the only way we're going to achieve it is to have the courage to pass a single-payer Medicare for all. Um, Chris, Christine in Colorado. Hi. Um, well, in Colorado last summer, we were campaigning for our Amendment 69, which was a tax-based uh, coverage for everyone in Colorado. So mm-hmm. it was a single payer based on taxation. And so I had a lot of experience doing that. And this fall, when that didn't get voted in, um, later in this spring, we had a town hall. And I went to the Douglas Landborn Town Hall in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is the article is called Deep in Red Territory. They carried it on Huffington Post. But what I did mm-hmm. was I made a homemade what? poster, and I made a house. And then at the top of the house, I took out a whole bar of people horizontally that were on Medicare. And on the bottom of the house, I took a whole bar of people that were out of it because they were kids, and kids don't buy health insurance, and they're on Medicaid. And then the side had all the people on the federal programs because in my area, a lot of people are on the governmental military programs. And then I showed another bar of the people that are sick enough as they are in their middle age to be on Medicaid and Medicare. And it leaves this little tiny box of people paying for all of it. And that was my point, was you can't build a health care program with 20% increase in premiums on the people in the middle. We just can't keep doing this. It's impossible for the little square left to to take care Mm -hmm. of everybody's bills. So and I think that what that's I that really has come home to me because I'm in middle age. I'm 57, and I can't buy health insurance. I yeah. can't afford it. Well, you've you've said a couple of good things. First of all, your own personal experience, if you're willing to share that, I think is powerful. Um, and coming up with a visual is such a good idea. Something that. That's a takeaway mm-hmm. message people will remember. They'll remember a visual sometimes way more than they'll remember being bombarded with 87 PowerPoint slides of data. So that's those. And, and did you say the name of the article is Deep in Red Territory? Yeah, it's that's the name of the article in the Huffington Post. And- like you, I went up afterwards, and there were a couple journalists that wanted to talk to me, but I chose the Huffington Post because they're not local, and our local paper tends to be very conservative and can sometimes twist the words, so I really didn't want to talk to them. <laughs> and maybe, you know, I should have been more okay. bold and trusted them, but I really trusted the more national news to carry it a little more closely. So. Well, I and, and I would say, you know, you have to use your best judgment there, but um, – especially because it's a conservative um, paper, if you, if you can be really sure that they're going to not take you out of, quote you out of context, um, that's going to get you into the homes of people that we don't always reach. So that, that's the other thing that I think we all have to be um, really wrapping our heads around it. Um, Tim brought up reaching out to the business community, um, and we also need to be reaching out to conservatives and Republicans and really stop framing single-payer Medicare for All, H.R. 676, as a liberal democratic piece of legislation. We've really got to stop messaging that way. And sometimes even messaging that health care is a human right. If you're talking to a group of conservative Republicans 
that's not going to resonate with them. So you want to have a in your back pocket another explanation for why this is a good thing. And that's where the business, talking about how it's good for business, it creates jobs, it, um, you know, removes the, 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 um, the whole health insurance annual deciding what you can offer and how much it's going to cost and how you can transfer, how you can cost shift more of it to your employees. I mean, you can talk about why this is a good thing without making the case that it's a human right, even if that's what resonates with you. Just know who your audience is and use the argument that's going to work best with them. Um, and I think we had Lee. I wasn't sure if I got the name right, but. Uh, yes, hi. After Christine. Uh, uh, yes, hi. This is Lee uh, Simmons from Boston. Um, one of the areas that I think comes up when talking to the public is their skepticism that physicians would support a single payer plan. Do you have any talking points about that? I, I mean, I feel like often we're preaching, we're, we're, you know, in circles talking about single payer plans. We're not often thinking about the perspective of other physicians. And I find that patients and lay audiences are skeptical that most physicians would be in favor. Do you have any talking points on that? Happy doctor. <laughs> uh, um, well, <laughs> can I, 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 Lee, can I just ask you, yes. did you go to the Mass Medical Annual Meeting? <laughs> Excuse me, I did not, not this year. Well, because I, I, I did, and, and, you know, I got, someone here got me to be um, a delegate, and I could go on about it, but there are a few points on that score. I mean, they, they don't, Mass Medical is unique, I guess, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, but at the end, you know, there was one resolution at the end. It was voted mm -hmm. down, and they got only one-third one third in favor, and it was sent back to the, uh, to the Board of Trustees to report back in December. And they said, well, so a third of them uh, in Massachusetts do support it, and mm -hmm. um, with vigor. So – Okay, so I, you're I'm, you're making me think. Um, I would I have I have I would not use I, I would not use the um, medical societies as the best measure of what right. doctors feel. Yeah. Uh, Margaret mm -hmm. Flowers and I wrote an editorial back in 2009 um, that was entitled "The AMA Does Not Represent Us." And the point mm -hmm. we were making is that I was opening, I, I used to live in Maryland, and I opened the Washington mm -hmm. Post one day and read this mm -hmm. article that said the AMA says blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I got this chill, and I thought, oh, my God, yeah. I wonder if my patients are reading this and think that that's mm -hmm. what I think and that's what mm -hmm. I want. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we did some research and discovered that actually the AMA um, – represents about 20, less than 25, I think now, percent of U.S. Mm -hmm. physicians, and the vast majority of them are retired or specialists. So mm -hmm. I would make the point that the AMA is not, necess is not a, a, the spokesperson for what American mm -hmm. physicians want. Um, mm -hmm. There are polls that show that the majority of doctors, they may not say they want H.R. 676, but they will say that they mm -hmm. want a national health program. Yeah. Okay? It, it, that's so helpful. What I, what I share, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I often share mm -hmm. my Go ahead. experience, which is the administrative burden being eased and my um, strong support for, our, for Mass Health here, Medicaid, and um, for working with Medicare. But I, I feel like that plays okay in Massachusetts, but not sure elsewhere. So thank you. 
Okay. I think the ease and also um, there was a health affairs study several years ago that um, came up with a figure of something like $56,000 a year that every physician, whether they're in a solo practice or a group practice, yeah. um, that's what they would save hey, just by just eliminating the administrative yes. cost of our mm -hmm. yeah, I heard multi-payer system. So, yeah, I mean, check your numbers, but, it, you know, yeah, you don't have to know the number. You could just say tens of thousands of dollars. Without seeing another patient, you give yourself a, a, a raise by simply eliminating the bureaucracy, besides yeah. the fact of which you give yourself, um, you know, something better than an aspirin or a shot of vodka as far as taking away mm -hmm. the stress of dealing with all of that nonsense. So we've got just a couple minutes left, and if um, if you don't mind, I thought I'd finish with um, this po this picture that was um, taken at the Trump rally in Nashville on I I think it was March 10th when President Trump um, came to Nashville ostensibly to put pressure on Lamar Alexander and Bob Corker, who are our two senators, um, trying to get the first iteration of the AHCA passed. And when I heard that um, the president was going to be speaking, um, it seemed like the right time and the right opportunity um, to do a direct action. Um, and so I... I waited in line for five and a half hours um, with Trump supporters, and that was a really good education because I, mm. when, when you're standing in line with people, they become more human. They really mm -hmm. do. And I found I was insulted by the snarky protest signs that didn't say anything about what the protester was for. All it said was snarky, mean stuff about Donald Trump or people who voted for him. And that's offensive. Mm -hmm. We're not going to win mm -hmm. this campaign. We're not going to win single payer by walking around with signs that are um, insulting. Yeah. So, you know, I, I learned a lot just by waiting in line with, with people. I had been to a Trump rally once before, so I knew that you're not allowed to bring any of your own signs in, and they have only um, – they, they, they offer you signs that you can hold up if you'd like to. Um, so I, I had a, an improved Medicare for All sign that I rolled up and slipped inside the sleeve of my <laughs> coat. And when he, and I, you know, I, what I'm saying is I, I planned this ahead of time. This is a very different kind of thing than just speaking out at a forum. This isn't the kind of thing you want to do impulsively. Um, I actually planned this out. I had somebody videotaping who had my business cards and delivered them to the press table. I positioned myself so that I was in earshot and view of the president and earshot mm -hmm. and view of the press table and close enough to the main floor that the police could get to me quickly in case the Trump mm -hmm. um, supporters became physically mm -hmm. aggressive, which they did not. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And what I did was he started, when he finally started talking about health care, I just held up the sign and I knew that I couldn't say anything that he would hear, and so I just chanted over and over, put your name on a plan that works, Medicare for all, and I, mm. I also knew I was going to be so scared that I wouldn't be able to think of anything more than just a chant that I could say over and over, and I kept saying it louder and louder until um, the police came and escorted me out, um, but that was a direct action that, um, because I, it was planned, resulted in some good press, 
um, and advanced the cause specifically in Nashville because um, I met with Jim Cooper the second, no, the first, the first time I met with him privately was about five days after this rally, and he knew what had happened. Um, and, and asked me about it and said, weren't you scared? And I said, well, you know, I, it, was a, it was a risk, but I, I was kind of banking on the fact that I'm an old white-haired white woman who's going to beat up Grandma Carol. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it worked. Um, but it was about 10 days, two weeks after that, that Jim Cooper, who is a blue dog Democrat, actually became a co-sponsor of H.R. 676. So, uh, you know, I don't know what combination of things made, you know, made the impression on him. He is is himself a health care expert. He teaches it at Vanderbilt. So, um, you know, I think he's had his own um, process to come around to this, but it, it really made an impression on me that sometimes just doing a direct action and organizing at the grassroots level. I mean, it was very clear that I'm, I had said to him before, just know that I'm organizing in your district and mm-hmm. uh, I'm growing the grassroots movement. So I'm not going away and this movement is not going to stop. So um, I think that it, there are ways to say that in a respectful but very firm and direct way um, that just puts your member of Congress on, on notice that you're not going away and you're not going to shut up. And you are going to keep speaking up for single payer. And that's the end of my talk, Kiora is a Maori um, term that means be well, be healthy. And that picture was taken at the Abel Tasman Great Walk on the northern tip of the South Island of New Zealand. So good night, everyone. I hope the picture puts you in a nice, happy place. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.